welcome to Cinema Classics. I'm your host, Nick Salerno, with this weekend's film, the 1944 production of Jane Eyre, based on the famous novel by Charlotte Bronte and starring Orson Welles as Rochester, Joan Fontaine as Jane, with Hilary Brooke as the fiance, and very, very young child actresses, Elizabeth Taylor, beautiful as ever, Peggy Ann Garner, and Margaret O'Brien, three of the best child stars we've ever had on screen. This is the first film that Orson Welles acted in after hitting it big as a director, hitting it big and flopping as a director. Citizen Kane, Magnificent Ambersons, brilliant film which didn't make it at the box office, of course, for a number of reasons. Journey into Fear also flopped, so he had to make some money. And in between that, had tried to do some political stuff, writing speeches for Franklin Roosevelt, for instance, but now, needing money, became an actor and established that kind of a character that he always played on screen, dark, glowering, and in this particular role, fitting Charlotte Bronte's description of Rochester as satanic. I think you'll enjoy watching this film. You'll love seeing Garner, O'Brien, and Taylor as youngsters. And after the film, we're going to have two really fine interviews with Dustin Hoffman, the star of Tootsie, and Sidney Pollock, who plays the agent in Tootsie and also directed the film. But first, let's watch Jane Eyre, 1944, with Joan Fontaine and Hilary Brooks. Robert Stevenson's 1944 production of Jane Eyre, starring Orson Welles and Joan Fontaine with young and pretty Elizabeth Taylor, Peggy Ann Garner, and Margaret O'Brien. And our interviews this weekend, as I told you earlier, are with Dustin Hoffman and Sidney Pollack, both of whom appear in the film Tootsie. Pollock, of course, also directed it. This film has a very, very troubled production history, and Hoffman talks about that in the course of the interview. Lots of people worked on the script, including Murray Shishkel, who is a good friend of Hoffman's, who has worked on a lot of projects with Hoffman, both for screen and stage. But the film went into production over months, over years, in fact, and an awful lot of money spent on this film, a very expensive production. And now that we've seen it, every cent of it worth it. It's a fantastically funny film, one of the best films certainly of 1982. I'm kind of wavering. I might even like it almost better than anything else that's appeared on screen this year. But a very troublesome film because in it, as probably everyone knows by now, Hoffman has to play more than just the typical Dustin Hoffman character. He has to play, first of all, the male Dustin Hoffman, Michael. Then he has to play Dorothy. Michael dresses up as a woman in order to make some points and in order to get some work. He dresses up as a woman. Dorothy. Dorothy, when she is Dorothy, plays a role on a TV show, a soap opera about a hospital. So there is a third characterization involved there. Michael playing Dorothy, who is playing the hospital administrator in the TV soap opera. So Hoffman is called upon to do an awful lot of very tricky things going from persona to persona to persona. Pollock plays the agent in this film, and Pollock is really fine. You wonder why, in fact, you don't see more of Pollock acting. He is exactly, and he's so fine, he might well be nominated for an Academy Award for Best Supporting Actor. Those nominations, incidentally, will come out in just about two weeks now. Hoffman is sure to be nominated. I think you'll really enjoy watching Tootsie. If you haven't seen it yet, I encourage you to go see it. There are still long lines for it on the weekend, but I think if you go to a weekday show, you'll get in. It's going to play for two or three months yet, I'm sure. These interviews were all taped in New York. In making Tootsie, did you shoot all of the sequences as a woman together and then all the sequences as a man together? Yes, you're the first person to ask me that. For the most part, we did. We thought we were going to only have to shoot six weeks for the when we started off that way get the hardest out of the way first and then the makeup problems were so devastating and uh and unsuccessful because we'd see the rushes the following day and i'd look green white blue and the color balance and the pock marks whatever so six weeks became 16 weeks and then i remember we started shooting michael uh -huh. and then then much later we had to come back and do some more but yes, for the most part, the body of it was, uh, the first 16 huh. weeks was... You don't make many films. Um, in picking them, do you tend to think of them as 
pieces of you immortalized in time. You're making art. Like, you know, Arthur Miller's thing about fame is like having your name written a keg of ice on a very oh, hot day. July day. Right. It's a great line. I'm glad you're the first person. That's one of my favorites. <laughs> he says that in a uh, introduction, I think, to Death of a Salesman. Death of a Salesman, right. And How do you feel about the, that I agree in, with in your it. films? I agree with it. I think it's a pretension that I'm a, that I'm a, 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 you know, a party to. Yes, being a mortal, I mean, you should know that, well, yes, the, the immortality is, 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 doesn't exist. That you, the best we can do is to carve our initials on a cake of ice on a hot July day. And, and I think if you think of the greatest film actors of our time, uh, you're hard pressed to come up with more than a few films of, of, of 40 or 50 or 60. I mean, even some of the, I mean, it, it bothers me. I got a book the other day of Charles Lawton, because he's one of my favorite film actors. I think he did extraordinary character work. Mm -hmm. And I said, Who, nobody cares about Charles Lawton today. I mean, you don't hear, I mean, a few filmophiles, but the majority of the film-going population have no interest in... They're too young for him. Or, yes, and it's something disturbing yeah. about that. There's no interest in what the Hunchback of Notre Dame he did or the Ruggles and Red Caps and the great characters who witness for the prosecution. This is great work. This is great work that would stand up today. So I guess I'm not doing it for that reason. So somehow it has to do with... Uh, and, and anyway, it's, it, I, I, don't, I, 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 I made the graduate in 67, and this is 1982. And Tootsie's the 15th film, so in a sense that's 15 films in 15 years. Sometimes I'll, I'll go two, three years, right. and then I'll do a couple together. But one film a year isn't that bad to me. I mean, it's, it takes a lot of time to prepare it. Uh, I do spend a, a, a time thinking about it. Um, I don't want to do bad work. I really don't want to do bad work. Uh, I try to do work that connects with me emotionally and that I feel there's a reason to do it. Sure. And I do feel, I, I do feel that I'm an audience, and I feel I I, I take the chance to, of thinking that the rest of the audience is like me, that they don't want to go to the theater and 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 have not just their money but their time wasted. Yeah. They're a part of their lives wasted. So there is a. I don't want to. I, I, I want to provoke you. I don't want you to just sit there and see a film. Mm. I, that happens a lot of times. But my prefer. I want to. I want to hit you, whether it makes you laugh or it makes you, I mean, I, that, is a, that is an intent that is behind sure. it. And, uh, and usually, it, and I've never seen it come out the way I would like it to. I mean, it's, I've, huh. uh, you know, you always fall short of it. Yeah. Alfredo Alfredo was really a big hit in Phoenix. He had the record, in fact, at one point for the longest running foreign film. I didn't know that. It's really true, and I wondered if what your reaction to the Italian experience was to filming that and with people working in a different language, etc. I had an unhappy experience on that because I was lied to. Uh, that was one of the first times I was lied to, so I didn't know it was a. I thought it was unusual then in film, <laughs> <laughs> but I was told uh, when I took that job that I could do it in Italian. In Italy, uh, they shoot what they call Q track. So the sound is just on a tape, that's, uh, and, they, and they, the director talks to you during the takes and all the noise that can happen because everything is done in the dubbing room after the film is cut. Right. All the actors go in. In fact, Fellini uses different actors for, he isn't, sometimes Mastriani he isn't Mastriani. You know, he gets a voice and a different uh -huh. face, and that's the way they work. Uh, so I thought given that, I would perfect the Italian dialogue that I had to speak six months later after it was shot and cut in the dubbing room. I would continue working on the dialect. And then after I got the part, they said I had to speak English and there was no way to get out of the job and I hadn't had it written correctly in the contract. So I show up at work having to play in Italian, speaking English with everyone else speaking Italian around me. And in that sense, it was, I, I, I was angry because I wanted to, again, I wanted to, I wanted to scale a mountain, and I wanted to play an Italian, speaking Italian, amongst Italians, and, sure. and, 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 and blend. Uh, I do like the film. I like the film when they use an Italian, I don't know what played in Phoenix, but when they use... They, it was in Italian, it wasn't dubbed. So they had an Italian playing, uh, using Dustin my voice. Hoffman, right? Well, that's, <laughs> and that's a version I, I like. Uh -huh. I like it a lot. Huh. Uh, I know that you and Murray Shishkel are good friends. And I wonder if you had any input into the script. I think, for instance, that I remember reading stories about the journey of the fifth horse in a play called A or A, uh, something like a. that, done in Berkshire, that seemed to me to reflect incidents in this film about return to Love Canal, et cetera. 
Was any of that your idea to put this? No, well, A was not, the, in the Berkshires I did these one acts of Murray's. They, they weren't A or, or the other one that you mentioned. They were uh, fragments and, a, and a, the old Jew and a couple of other plays. But they were plays where you had problems with the directors, as I remember. Well, I always had problems with directors. I see. I, <laughs> I had problems with, a, with directors growing up at home. <laughs> My first director, I had <laughs> You know, so, <laughs> I, you know, it's never been any different for me. I, I, you have less power after you, uh, you have less power after you become, if you, and, and if you become famous mm -hmm. than you did before, because you could say goodbye off Broadway. I don't agree with you, goodbye, get another actor. Uh -huh. and, and I did, and you'd walk off, because I don't want to do bad work, and Which, I'd rather, Tootsie, did, which Michael yes, does in Tootsie. Yes. Once right. you're, or if you become prominent, famous, you're not allowed to. You have to, right. you have to struggle your way through it because you'll be sued for the rest of your life if you walk sure. off. Mm -hmm. Okay, look, I sent you a play to read that my roommate wrote. It had a great part in it for me. Did you read it? Where the hell do you come off sending me your roommate's play for you to star in? I'm your agent, not your mother. I'm not supposed to find plays for you to star in. I'm supposed to field offers, and that's what I do. Field offers? Who told you that? The agent fairy? That was a significant piece of work. I could have been terrific in that play. Michael, nobody's going to do that play. Why? Because it's a downer, that's why. Because oh. nobody wants to produce a play about a couple that moved back to Love Canal. But that actually happened. Who gives a sh**? Nobody wants to pay $20 to watch people living next to chemical waste. They can see that in New Jersey. Look, I don't want to argue about it, okay? I'm going to raise the $8,000 myself so I can produce his play. And I want you to send me up for anything. I don't care what it is. I will do dog commercials on television. I will do radio voiceovers. Michael, I can't put you up for any of that. Why not? Because no one... Will hire you. Oh, that's not true, man. I bust my ass to get a part right, and you know I do. Yes, and you bust everybody else's ass, too. That's what you do. A guy's got four weeks to put on a play. You think he wants to sit and argue about whether or not Tolstoy can, can walk when he's dying, or walk when he's talking, or sing oh, when please, he's that walking. That was two years ago, and that guy is an idiot. They and can't all be idiots, Michael. You argue with everybody. you got one of the worst reputations in this town, Michael. Nobody will hire you. You seem to use name actors in most of your film rather than an unknown. you have a real preference for that? It's habit more than anything. I just have always done it. Um, I, the first film I ever did, I made with two stars, with Sidney Poitier and Anne Bancroft in 1965, just after they'd won and each won the Academy Award the, the previous sun, year. The Thunder Threat. Yeah. And um, I sort of, more than anything, just got in the habit of it, to be honest with you. It's, it was easy. <laughs> I mean, it was easier to do that. <laughs> than to go off and look for unknowns. Uh -huh. So I just got in the habit now when I read a script, I think, well, is this right for Joe Clayburgh or Jane Fonda or Redford or Streisand mm -hmm. or whatever? There's a, a num there are a number of jokes in Tootsie about being in the business to make money versus th theater as an art form. Now, I'm not being facetious. Is that the way you look at filmmaking is money? Well, would, would you think that somebody would be in the film business because they don't want to make money? Well, no, but let's take Scarecrow. Wonderful movie, but even from the start, it couldn't have been thought of as a money maker. I produced Scarecrow. Right. Well, uh, there are certain pictures that you do because you, die, you want to do them. I didn't do Tootsie because I thought it was going to make money. Huh. I mean, I didn't do any of the pictures. It's going to make a mint. I hope you're right. Oh, I know I'm right on this one. <laughs> if I did pictures because I thought they would make money, I'd probably be so wrong most of the time that it, that it, you know, it wouldn't be funny. I mean, the studio heads are fired every year and change places every year because they're in the unfortunate position of trying to predict what people will like. That is something nobody can do, I don't think. Least of all, a film director. Well, the yeah. first thing a film, the only thing a film director can do is say, and it requires a certain arrogance. And that is that if I like it, I got to believe other people will like it. That's the only thing you can operate on. So I have to do what I like. I can't do what I think will make money because I don't really know what will make money. They make a picture and it makes a fortune. Then they make a sequel to the picture with all the same elements and it's a flop. It doesn't work. Yeah. It doesn't work. So there, there isn't any secret to making money, you know. Um, I think that's a kind of a sophomoric view, really, that there are two kinds of theater, art and commercialism. I mean, Dickens was a very commercial writer. He was also a great artist. Celine wrote novels that nobody read. He was also a great writer. It doesn't, because one sells, doesn't mean it's therefore bad. The Godfather, I think, is a great movie as a piece of art. It's also a very commercial movie. Right. 
No, I don't think one is impossible without the other. I really don't. Mm -hmm. Let's pursue something specific about Tootsie, the sequence where Hoffman, Dorothy, is posing for magazine covers, and it's very fast-cutting, etc. Where does the director's work leave off and the editors begin in a sequence like that? Well, I don't know how other directors work, but I do my own editing. I mean, you do? Yeah. I mean, I don't physically edit, but I sit in the room and say, cut this here, and now go to the close-up, and now do this, and now do that. I think most most directors who have an idea of how they want something to look do do that, you know. I mean, every scene in this picture has a rhythm to it and a style to it, sure. and you're on one person for a certain moment and another person for another moment. Now, I have to go through, I go through every take that Dustin does and pick out what I think are the best ones. I go through every take that Jessica Lang does and pick out what I think are her best moments or her softest moments, if that's what I'm going for. And then I have to figure out how to get them put together. Now, the editor helps me enormously. I mean, he does the physical work for me, and sometimes I say to him, here's what I want in the scene, go do it, give me a rough go at it first, and he'll get 50% of the way there, let's say, on his own. Then I'll sit down and I'll say, okay, here, where you went to that close-up, don't use that close-up because that's not good. Use this close-up and don't stay that long. Uh -huh. Now let's go to the two-shot. I see. So, um, I would no more dream of shooting 400,000 feet of film and then handing it to an editor and going to Wisconsin for a vacation or something <laughs> than the man in the moon. I would never get the film I wanted. All right, let's pick up on your shooting all these foot of films. What is your shooting ratio about? It went up on this film. Normally I shoot between 180 and 200,000 feet of film for a, a two hour film, which is 12,000 feet. That's very low. I mean, most people shoot more. Hmm. I shot double that on this particular picture. I shot 400,000 feet, wow. twice as long as I've ever gone. Because I used multiple cameras on things like I the see. soap opera work, so for each time there would normally have been only one camera rolling, I had three cameras rolling. The sequence where he reveals himself as a man, right. I shot 40,000 feet of film oh, on, wow. alone. That's a lot of film. Hmm. Because I used three cameras wide, then three cameras medium, and then three cameras close, and maybe 10 or 15 takes on each one. Hmm. So that, that grinds out the film pretty fast. Well, in Tootsie, you're as good an actor as you are a director, which is wonderful in both cases. What made you decide to be in it, too? Uh, Dustin made me decide to be in it. <laughs> he had this wild hair that I should play his agent, and he pushed and pushed and cajoled and convinced <laughs> and uh, finally talked me into it. Huh. I haven't been any, in, a, in a film in 22 years. but You actually started out acting, though. I did start out as an actor, and the uh, last film I did was in 1960. Mm. There's a rumor or a legend or whatever that Burt Lancaster was one of those who said, try directing now. Yeah, Is that he, right? Uh, he was the guy that talked me into directing, yes. Huh. You did um, one really marvelous Mar Natalie Wood movie. Yes, uh, this property is condemned. condemned. I, I love which that. we will be running on my station pretty soon. Oh, great! I wondered if you might comment on Wood's talent as an actress. I think Natalie was one of those people uh, that comes along every once in a while where you get confused by her prettiness and don't really give her the kind of credit. You know, she's going to be the victim of the same kind of sentimental guilt trip by people that Marilyn Monroe was. You know, she'll right. gain stature as time goes by, we'll go back, we'll rediscover her films. Because the truth of the matter is, she was a damn good actress. Oh, a much one better actress than serious critics gave her credit for. She was great in Rebel Without a Cause. She was great in Splendor in the Grass. I think she was great in my picture. She mm -hmm. was terrific in Love with a Proper Stranger. She was a wonderful actress. Uh, and she represented something about the best of that time in the 50s, you know, when she was in her prime, really, the 50s and the early 60s. Um, I don't know why, every once in a while people pick up somebody and they can't get past the looks or the physical quality and they and they just don't want to give it to you so to speak you know <laughs> now that she's dead unfortunately i think they probably will oh, no, that's I, too bad yeah but I, I agree with you on how great an actor she was 
And I'll say again how wonderful film Tootsie is. Congratulate you on doing it, and thank you for doing the interview. Thank you very much. The Directors Guild of America has named Pollock as one of the five best directors of 1982. And I couldn't agree with him more on Natalie Wood in general as an actress or about his, her performance in This Property is Condemned, which is going to be the film that we bring you on Cinema Classics next week. Natalie Wood and Robert Redford, directed by Sidney Pollock in This Property is Condemned on Cinema Classics at our regular times, Saturday night at 8 and Sunday afternoon at 1. I'm your host, Nick Salerno. Join me then. Broadcasting from the campus of Arizona State University, this is KAET Phoenix, Channel 8, your public television station.